Rick Santelli and Sharma Capital are standing by at the CME Group in Chicago. The government is promoting bad behavior. Why don't you put up a website to have people vote on the internet as a referendum to see if we really want to subsidize the losers' mortgages. This is America. How many of you people want to pay for your neighbor's mortgage that has an extra bathroom and can't pay their bills? How about we all... President Obama, are you listening? How about it. we all stop paying our mortgage? It's a moral hazard. Cuba used to have mansions and, and a relatively decent economy. They moved from the individual to the collective. Now they're driving 54 Chevys. Maybe the last great car to come out of Detroit. Yeah, have you raised any money for Blago? No, but I think that somebody's going to have to start raising money for us. <laughs> the silent majority. It's Britney, bitch. And uh, the Iraq, everywhere, like, such a... I'm supposed to be the franchise player, and we're in here talking about practice. Well, then... well, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. Out, Charlie! Out! Our next-door neighbors are foreign countries. I call upon all nations to do everything they can to stop these terrorist killers. Thank, Thank you. you. Now watch this drive. Hey, everybody, and welcome to Remember Shuffle. My name is Ben. With me, as always, is my co-host, Jordano. Hello. Hi. Oh, you don't have a thematic voice this time around? I could do Glenn Beck. Be like, hi, hello. Why isn't every podcast about the Constitution? Like our founding fathers would have done. <laughs> it's dangerously close to Tucker Carlson. Yeah, I know. I, the key to Glenn Beck actually is having a long-winded speech because he starts soft and then he, he builds himself up into anger and then eventually sadness. <laughs> yeah, as you say, you, you need the tears and the weepiness. You need yeah. a long time to do Glenn Beck. It's more of a crescendo. <laughs> And today we are joined by the all-time returning Remember Shuffle guest, none other than Kyle. Say hi, Kyle. Hey, oh, good to be back in the Shuffle House. <laughs> the Shuffle House, I love it. The dojo of the mind. I love that less. You like are the Steve Martin of our show. Like what Steve Martin is to SNL, that's what you've become for the Shuffle House. And you can consider this the sequel to one of our most popular episodes on the 2008 election, for which Kyle was also here. So we're going to see what happened after, what happened next after the election of President Barack Obama. And I like to think of this as two roads diverged in 2009, and we took the one less traveled by good socialist policy, but much more traveled by Ben Franklin LARPers. Because today we are discussing the Tea Party. This absolutely bonkers, popular, question mark, movement supporting free market utopianism. We're talking about the insane contradictions of their ideology and the tangible, heinous, real world effects that this movement had. And I want to say right off the bat, so that we don't get accused of plagiarism, that one book that we all read in prepping for this episode was Thomas Frank's Pity the Billionaire. And it is a book that we recommend in the strongest possible terms because it goes through everything. Pick up this book if you're interested in it at all. But this book did come out in 2011. So where we see ourselves adding to the conversation is having a little bit of hindsight to see what happened after then. Slightly different angle. And we also read in preparation for this a combination of some economics papers and also uh, decision points by George Bush and <laughs> a promised land by Barack Obama because a lot of the Tea Party is a reaction to the 2008 financial crisis. And we've sort of put the horse before the cart here in that we are doing an episode on the Tea Party before the financial crisis. Well, we will cover the financial crisis in this episode, give you some light background. So what happens is the Tea Party emerges because of two government interventions in the economy. The first being the bailout of the banks, which were absolutely necessary. And the second being Obama's attempt to pass health care legislation. So you have these acts of government at the macro and micro level, coupled by the fact that, you know, they were done by Barack Obama. Barack Hussein Obama. <laughs> yeah, leading to a, a mass movement of millions of people who were against almost any government intervention in the economy to ease people's suffering during the greatest economic downturn since the Great Depression. And one thing I want to stress is that what's so unique and fascinating about the Tea Party is that there is this groundswell of popular anger that happens, right? It's not like everyone at those rallies was a fucking paid crisis actor like Alex Jones style. There was totally legitimate people-driven anger, and there was this brilliant, in its evilness, switcheroo, where people were legitimately pissed off at what the government did for banks, 
And these article heads, and I hesitate to call them thinkers, but the Glenn Becks of the world, the Rush Limbaugh's of the world, were able to completely redirect and muddle this popular anger that resulted in a movement marching in the streets in favor of the free market. Not a whole lot of movements like that. Not a whole lot of movements that are out there saying, government, do less, please. (laughs) Yeah, it's a story that is as, as much about the success in the, of the right in co-opting this energy as well as just the utter failure of the left to in any way harness or direct that same furor and outrage into anything constructive. because yeah, America is already great. I don't know if you heard from Hillary Rodham Clinton, famous winner. The last thing I'll say is that in 2008, election of Obama, Obama mania, and 2009, there was a moment where conventional wisdom was that the spell of neoliberalism had been broken. Shit, man. The deregulation, the privatization, the deindustrialization, the deunionization, all of the classic neoliberal policies had cratered the economy. You had someone like Francis Fukuyama said that the age of Reagan was ending in 2008. This man can't make a prediction to save his fucking life. (laughs) He is batting zero, it looks like. He is the Jim Cramer of economic philosophy. (laughs) And everyone was assuming like, okay, the GOP, they're either dead or they're going to have to take a serious time out. They have fucked the dog on this one. They doubled down on the free market ideology and won huge in the 2010 midterms. What was supposed to happen did not happen. And what's crazy in this very brief window, you got Time Magazine putting Obama on the cover and he looks like FDR. You got people talking about a new, new deal. They weren't calling it that, but they should have. Misbranding opportunity. Some of these like Alan Greenspan types are testifying before Congress saying my ideology, my faith in the free market and its self-regulating was wrong. There was this brief glimmer of hope that was dashed. And instead we got the don't tread on me crew coming out. One of the, the funniest things to have revisited is like the number of like books and articles and things that came out in 2008 with just a title of like conservatism is dead. <laughs> just <laughs> swinging a yeah. miss. Yeah, 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 it's over. It's never been more over, they said. <laughs> yeah, fast forward like, seven months. We are so bad. <laughs> <laughs> So just to do a little signposting for the episode on what we're going to be talking about today, we'll do a short section on the financial crisis and the government's reaction to it. Then we'll move towards the Tea Party and their ideology. We'll do a reading series from Glenn Beck's book. And finally, we'll finish up with some of the real world impact that the Tea Party had on society. Yeah. So now let's see what happened. What happened? to give us this brief moment of utopian hope (laughs) in the death of neoliberalism. How did this crash happen? Let's sketch that out. So like I said, we'll do an episode later on the 2008 financial crisis because it probably is worth a two or three part series, honestly. But you know the story that banks over leveraged themselves buying these mortgage-backed securities, including synthetic mortgage-backed securities, and they crashed. They faced a liquidity <laughs> crisis. Ben's getting mad at me because he doesn't want me to use the term liquidity crisis on the pod. He's about to do the snoring sound. Yeah, <laughs> yeah do the drop. Do the drop, Trudeau. Excuse me. You need to go back to grad school. <laughs> I will say, so I did go to grad school for economics. And, and even when I was in grad school, which was after the crisis, they were still obsessed with the Laffer curve and these Reagan era economics programs. Like nobody had lost faith in any of this. So we have to bail out the bank, starting with TARP. <laughs> killing me, Drew. You are killing me on this one. All you need to know for now is that the economy tanked and George Bush, the guy who's obsessed with the free market, our Republican president, passes TARP and bails out AIG. George Bush is a free market ideologue because at the end of the day, this free market fascination is a LARP. George Bush, even he knew that he had to step in and intervene with the economy. And he talks about it in his book. I read Decision Points, would not recommend brutal, brutal stuff. (laughs) Awful. But he says, I'm sitting there holding them. And it actually reminded me a lot of the dark night, you know, when everybody's on the boat and they're like, you got to fucking blow up that other boat, you know, but nobody can bring themselves to do it. That's how he feels holding the economic nuclear button, nuclear, nuclear button, you know, (laughs) nuclear, (laughs) nuclear button. He's like, I knew that I had uh, an obsession with free markets and like there was all sorts of moral hazard. But I also knew that by not saving those banks, I was going to be causing hundreds of millions of people distress. And at the end of the day, you can only follow your ideology so far. But if the suffering of hundreds of million people is on the other side of that ideology, like you have to do the bailouts. So even he knew that. And it was so frustrating reading his fucking 
fucking book because he ends the chapter with a few paragraphs talking about the sacrosanctity of the free market. And it's like, yeah, you just did an exception to that. And now yep. you're going right back to talking about how the free market is always right. What about working out your thoughts? Don't you have any cognitive fucking dissonance about what you just had to do, you fucking idiot? Anyway. <laughs> yeah. And to put a number on how bad this was, Thomas Frank points out that $16 trillion of household wealth was just immolated on a pyre in 2008, 2009. And this is like real money. This isn't the fake money that the government prays and gives to Boeing. This is like people's savings and houses and livelihoods that were just nuked. And this is with the small intervention that we did. The idea is that every economist agrees that this collapse was the result of deregulation first and foremost, all contributed to this massive collapse from the banking industry. So what you would expect to happen would be people demanding, much like the 1930s, that the government step in and do something both to help them and maybe even to punish some of the people who fucked up so bad, maybe even punish some of these bankers in an ideal world. That's not what happens. Small context for people who maybe don't remember this for our Zoomers in the audience who are too young. <laughs> the thing about this is that at every step of the process that led up to this, there were people in charge of these banks and in charge of the regulation, all this, who were making the decisions, inched it, like constantly really barreling towards this all the way. And I think it almost gets talked about or painted as like, oh, I don't know. We just kind of uh, one day the scales tipped or like they're suddenly the things weren't where they were supposed to be when we went to open our little coin bag and. Uh oh. <laughs> but this was a, literally like people in charge, people making decisions. The people famously getting paid millions or billions of dollars a year to do this were the ones who brought us to the very end. The most highly compensated people in the country. Yeah. The people creating the synthetic credit default swaps and stuff like that. Yeah. They, they were the ones who fucked it up. Actually, Kyle, this is a perfect segue to talk about a little magazine called Traders Monthly, the way you talking about the rich assholes who made all these decisions. So during the boom years of the Bush administration, here's how the economic breakdown work. If you were a professional, you did okay. You either like stayed the same or maybe you take your income ticked up a little bit. If you were an hourly worker, you did worse from 2000 to 2008. And if you were a trader, if you worked in finance, you killed in the Bush years. And there was a magazine called Trader Monthly. It no longer exists. I know because I stopped getting my subscriptions. <laughs> This magazine was targeted at men with a net worth of $2 million or more, raking in $450,000 a year. Its tagline was, see it, make it, spend it. This is another thing for the Zoomers. Before podcasting, the only <laughs> way to make that kind of money was on Wall Street. <laughs> and it just advertised shit for you to buy. Normal rich asshole stuff like sports cars and whatever the fuck. But to give you an idea of the culture, it advertised a $300,000 record. Record player. Did they target it at audiophiles? At real music heads? Is this so you can listen to your symphonies? No, it's so that you can have a quote, huge middle finger to your guests. Why am I flipping off my guests? They're my buds. I'm having them over for dinner. Huey <laughs> Lewis in the news them. really sounds so much better than the $300,000 <laughs> record player. <laughs> I bought the $7,000 act. <laughs> That's a good... If you want to imagine what these assholes were like, American Psycho and Wolf of Wall Street are the two cornerstone texts to understand who these guys were who were doing this type of stuff. Just depraved monsters who only goal in life was to increase their net wealth and fuck everybody else. And Ben's point here is that this is what we traded all of the deregulations for. I get, you know, a deregulated financial services industry and you get the biggest assholes of your society Society are able to get it, use it, spend it. <laughs> Great trade. <laughs> it's the 80s and 90s. America is no longer manufacturing anything. It's producing nothing at this point. However, its key area where it is still innovating past the rest of the world is just chopping money up into stranger and stranger <laughs> forms that are harder and harder to understand. Uh, and that's how you get a default credit swap. That's really where our, our brain power was at. We, we've, been, we've been in the lab cooking up new kinds of fraud. <laughs> Watch this space. New fraud dropping soon. I believe Giordano has a prepared bit on different schools of economic thought that he would like to elaborate on. <laughs> 
Okay. So I, I do want to set this up by saying that there are a lot of different schools of economic thought, including the Austrian school of economics, which believes in this Ayn Rand stuff of never interfering with the economy. There's also a Marxist school of economics. But there's also what's called the Stockholm school, which you know behaves like Scandinavian governments do. It's also known as Keynesian economics during crisis times. And so the idea behind Keynesian economics is that these fluctuations in the business cycle are inevitable. And when there is low demand, i.e. like during a recession, the government should step in to make up part of that demand and lighten the effects of potential recessions. And this government bailout was absolutely the right thing to do. Given the economic system that we had in 2008, it was the right thing to do because we know that during the Great Depression in the 1930s, there was a Republican administration in power in 1928 to 1932. And what they did was nothing, right? It was austerity. Let's spend less. Let's do tariffs. And, it, and the economy just got worse and worse. And in the 80 years since the Great Depression, there's been a lot written about what the solutions were, including by Milton Friedman, who wrote this academic uh, premise on it, that no one disputes that what FDR did was good. Having a loose monetary and fiscal policy was the right solution for the Great Depression. And this reminds me so much of that SpongeBob SquarePants scene with Patrick Starr and Rayman, where we're like, okay, uh, during the Great Depression, a loose monetary and fiscal policy got us out of it. Yep. This is like the Great Depression. That makes sense to me. So we should also have a loose monetary and fiscal policy now. Doesn't look familiar to me. What? You know? <laughs> <laughs> and so no one disputes what FDR did, right? Everybody is happy with those programs. I think it was like a moment for America that they we're proud of to be like, we helped out the little guy. We did government intervention to help people's lives. And this economist that I like, Barry Eichengreen from the University of California, Berkeley, said that our bailouts of the financial system largely saved us from the worst effects of the Great Depression. Like during the Great Depression, unemployment got as high as 25%, but it maxed out around 10% during the Great Recession. And he actually says we didn't do it nearly enough. We should have been spending more to help people. We should have bailed out Lehman Brothers, which we let fall in the early days of the crisis, because this is exactly what we should do during the Great Depression. It's like what we hoped the, the administration of 1928 would have done. And then yet when our version of that comes around, we're like, I don't know, because at the end of the day, this Great Recession was not caused by a natural disaster. It wasn't caused by like a bad harvest. It was a liquidity crisis. All the homes that lost all this value, there's so much more valuable today than they were even at the height of prices in 2006. These are inherently valuable assets. Trudeau coming in hot with the housing crisis that we're in now is actually good. Look at how valuable <laughs> the homes are. No, I'm just saying that like the problem that they had was was a liquidity crisis. There was a, like a crisis of confidence and the government did make money off of the bailouts because it bought part of the banks and then it sold them with interest in the few years that followed and it made its money back and more because American homes are valuable. They're one of the most valuable assets in the entire world. And so if there is a liquidity crisis, it's the government's job to step in, regulate it and keep it afloat until confidence returns. Giordano, I'm a simple, humble country redacted. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm no economist, but my understanding is the bailout of the banks needed to happen mm -hmm. because that's where people's money was. And so if the banks fail, then the people who thought they were doing the right thing and put their money in the bank, they lose lose their money. Similar to a, 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 another little organization that I think should have got a bailout called FTX recently. <laughs> <laughs> But isn't the difference is like back in the 30s, things were bailed out. However, that came with consequences and it came with an expectation that things were put into conservatorship. So the government says like, we will bail you out, but actually we're kind of in charge now because you fucking blew it so bad mm -hmm. that if we just bail you out and let you keep going, you'll fuck it up again and we can't allow that. Plus the regulation and plus money didn't just go to the banks. It also went into all these programs and all these things that directly went to people, normal people who were suffering. And the difference is they only bailed out the banks and the rich people <laughs> and then didn't do any of the other stuff. Yep, that, so that's exactly right. That after the Great Depression, we were able to pass a lot of regulations on the consumer banking industry like Glass-Steagall, none of which really happened after the Great Recession. A big part of that is because banks have a, a face, right? But the failure of the Great Recession wasn't the fault of regular people doing a bank run. It was investors doing a bank run on like the shadow banking industry. Like regular people never interact with companies like AIG or 
Lehman Brothers, right? Only banks will interact with those organizations. And so we needed the same type of regulatory effort towards this shadow banking industry. And that largely didn't happen. And then, like you said, there's like monetary expansion. There's like monetary versus fiscal expansion. And we did a lot of the monetary policies from the Great Depression, but we didn't do any of like the fiscal policies of the Great Depression, meaning the government didn't spend money helping regular people with something like the Tennessee Valley Authority, for example, right? Nobody argues that like the Tennessee Valley Authority was a bad idea. Like there's no one, there's no one willing to get on that soapbox, right? These damn so, dams, man. <laughs> the sad thing is that if you go and, and read, there's actually a tremendous number of people who argue exactly that. And you also <laughs> argue that everything FDR did was bad. They're wrong. Are they economists? Idiots? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh really? Um, okay. Well, it's all part of the myth making, right? Like it's all part of these fucking Ayn Randian freaks mm -hmm. that are just looking to generate, you know, if I'm an economist and I'm looking for proof that these things are bad and no one else has written it, I guess I'm in a good spot to be like, well, I guess I'll write that down and then someone can cite me and then we can, yeah. we can get something going here. I can at least get a sponsorship from the John Birch Society or something. But yeah, there was the TARP bailout first under Bush and there was also the auto bailout under Obama, which is something we're not talking about today. But Kyle, you were talking about the stimulus package also, which was like the spending to generate economic activity, to give people jobs. And, you know, maybe we end up with a with a nice little Tennessee Valley authority out of it. And this is one where like Obama tipped his hand that he was not going to be FDR part two. His loser. <laughs> in those negotiations, he said, I refuse to let it go over a trillion dollars because that number is too scary. Oh, no, no, the big numbers make me scared or whatever. So it taps out at 750 bill or whatever. And half of it is tax breaks so that he can encourage Republicans to vote for it in bipartisan consensus. And none of them fucking do. And that's why it stinks because half of the thing, it wasn't like shovel ready projects. We didn't get high speed rail or more hydroelectric dams or any of that shit out of it. And again, we got to keep saying fucking Joe Brandon had a larger stimulus package. The, I know he didn't get the full bill back Brandon bill, but the one that we got the infrastructure bill better than Obama's with a smaller majority in Congress. And maybe just to like summarize it as simply as possible is a bunch of shitty bankers and these like financial leaders really fucked up. A lot of people suffered and it's hard to like you say, like how, however many trillions like evaporated and it's hard to capture like what that actually meant for people whose savings and their investments and all these things that they thought they were doing right just plummeted and people who suddenly could not afford their mortgage and all these different things. People would just literally walk into banks and like throw their keys at the teller and be like, I, I can't do this anymore. Um, so it take it, I guess that type of thing going on mass. And then the response is to make sure that the people who made all the decisions that made that happen got paid and then nobody else did. The bankers, they get their bailout, they get their bonuses. And then the people who lose their house have no house. And that's that's their story. Yep. And it might be worth now doing a quick comparison between the 1930s and 2008. I mean, that's what we've been doing. But one thing I would like to stress is something Thomas Frank points out, citing some labor historians, is that the 1930s saw this huge uptick in neighborliness and compassion and community. According to one labor historian, it was the decade of participation and belonging during the hard times, right? We've all seen It's a Wonderful Life. The whole community comes together to keep George Bailey from offing himself. <laughs> and 2008 goes entirely the other way. And I think if you fast forward to the fucking epidemic and crisis of loneliness that we're in now, <laughs> we could have used a little participation and belonging back in 2008. Talk about another like road not travel that we might have taken. But like one example, in the 30s in Iowa, again, following Frank, Iowa farmers would come together in a farmers association and they made it impossible to evict someone from their house. They would like shut down the roads. They would throw out produce so that the prices would rise and they weren't able to actually affect a change in prices but all of this action led to the Roosevelt administration passing the agricultural bills and mortgage remediations and all that shit. Meanwhile a very frequent sign at Tea Party rallies was your mortgage is not my problem, right? Talk about just the fucking bizarro world mirror image of the 30s which is not only are we doubling down on free market capitalism, we're doubling down on fucking selfish individualism on top of that as well. No community, no Tennessee Valley Authority, no fucking George Bailey. Imagine the Tea Party, It's a Wonderful Life, and Rand, It's a Wonderful Life, how that movie goes. It's a wonderful strife. Yeah. We love the fact that we're suffering. It teaches us to be better. We're in competition with one another. The shortest movie ever. It's just someone with a tri-corner hat going, yeah, you should definitely kill yourself, bro. <laughs> and Fox, you lose. You, you lost. <laughs> Mr. Potter is the better banker. Ha, ha, ha.
Mr. Potter will run a more efficient system in Bedford Falls. You know, uh, you know how like the angel shows George Bailey what life would be like if he had never been born? Well, yeah, it's like the Tea Party angel showing him how you know, if George Bailey had died and, and couldn't have a savings and loan business, everybody wouldn't be able to take out loans and instead would work in like a, a Levitt town run by Mr. Potter. And he, <laughs> because he's a millionaire, he has a more efficient allocation of capital and it is getting better returns to scale from like everybody being immiserated. And so he's like, don't you see, if you had never been born, the GDP of Bedford Falls would have been three to five percent higher per annum. <laughs> Oh, so good. It's Wonderful Life is the single greatest piece of American socialist propaganda that was ever <laughs> but, Yeah, and I think where the populist anger came from is the unconditional nature of the help that the bankers got. You, as an average Joe, could never expect such good treatment that the bankers got in 2008. Socialism for the rich, rugged individualism for the rest of us. Doing research for this episode really made me think about like, every time I had like an uncle or my dad, sorry, dad, uh, talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> about like economics, which was for a lot of us, if our parents came of age in the 80s, they really got into this greed is good, the free market rocks. And then after the Soviet Union fell, it was like a complete vindication of American values. Right. And so this idea that government is bad and that, you know, the, the nine scariest words in the English language are I'm from the government and I'm here to measure your penis. <laughs> Just taking that at face value and applying it dogmatically, every situation you ever encounter, government bad, private industry good, mm -hmm. right? That is so poisonous. And I am like truly thankful that a lot of millennials and even more so with Gen Z are recognizing that it is an insane ideology. Like why have a country at all? <laughs> <laughs> if, if the whole point is you should always strive to make as much money as you can yourself, never help out anyone else. The most efficient outcome is actually you behaving as selfish as possible. Yeah. And what's so insidious about it is that it masquerades as a non-ideology. Like you use the religion metaphor. They're dogmatic about this. They're religious about this. This is a quote from Time magazine talking about Alan Greenspan, Rob Rubin, and motherfucking Larry Summers talking about their ideology. Quote, Rubin, Greenspan, and Summers have outgrown ideology. Their faith in the markets and in their own ability to analyze them recalls nothing so much as the objectivist philosophy of the novelist and social critic Ayn Rand. During long nights at Rand's apartment and through her articles and letters, Greenspan found in objectivism a sense that markets are an expression of the deepest truths mm. about human nature and that, as a result, they will ultimately be correct. Great journalism time. Nothing ideological here. Yeah, it's, Dog shit. it's sick. And I just kept getting the vision of these conservatives as being the uh, in Mad Max, you know, the like your heads who would inhale the spray paint and then drive off. That's what these people are with free market economics. They are driving to economic Valhalla, white knuckling <laughs> their car into the desert because <laughs> as the economy is tumbling, they're like, let it burn. Like, let it <laughs> <laughs> While Dick Army hangs suspended by his nipples, just shredding an electric guitar. <laughs> And yeah. we've seen what happens when we follow that advice. We get massive increases in wealth inequality. One, but I don't know if you guys remember like the Sam Brownback's Kansas experiment that he ran recently. He was a Tea Party guy and he got a chance to run the state. And he said, I'm going to use this as an experiment to show everybody that Ayn Rand fucking works. And so <laughs> he cut taxes by two thirds with the expectation that, hey, if I cut taxes by half and the economy doubles, this is hey. supply side economics, baby. We're making the same amount of money. We'll pay less taxes. Anyway, <laughs> that's like not what happened. You cut taxes by half. The, the state government ran into year after year of budget shortfalls because the economy actually shrank compared to other states. Oh, did 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 corporations not reinvest those profits <laughs> in their businesses? Did they just put it in like stock buybacks and shareholder dividends? Is that what happened? And the government was short like $600 million and their solution <laughs> was, well, what if we ended the school year in April? <laughs> <laughs> and so parents had nowhere to send their kids oh, no. for months. And the, the Atlantic did a story on this. And I listened to these parents who were like, yeah, I voted for Sam Brownback because I was like, yeah, this makes economic sense. But now I have nowhere to send my kids. <laughs> and he's so dumb. My kid keeps getting dumber. I don't <laughs> I didn't expect this. Yeah. Sam Brownback said that his tax cuts will be like a shot of adrenaline into the heart of the Kansas economy. He thought it would be like the scene from Pulp Fiction. Yeah. He thought it would be 
the shot of the heart into Uma Thurman scene from Pulp Fiction. What they got was the gimp scene from Pulp Fiction (laughs) to their economy. One of the funny things I read about that was it was the first state to ever just cut all the grants and things that come from a state to pay for artistic endeavors and and creative things. And basically the reasoning given was like, well, art should only come from private enterprise and like people should find private sponsors. And it's like, okay, so your solution is everyone should find a Medici. That's that's just now. (laughs) That's now how art is going to happen. Kyle, Um, your patron is not my problem. (laughs) Yeah, I remember actually going to see Arcade Fire perform live once and they were like, the only reason we are here is because we got a government grant to work on our music for a while and it turned into this. So CanCon, baby, let's go. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But yeah, just to finish up this Sam Brownback section, it was so funny because the state was in absolute disarray for years. They had to take money out of the highway system. They had to take it out of like the pension system. And eventually people clamored to raise their taxes again. They put in someone new and they were pl- they were like, please <laughs> triple our taxes. <laughs> you really do feel like the the mom in like an abusive marriage or something in that you actually have to be like, no, we need taxes. Like I know your dad is saying that we can have dessert for dinner, but like he's drunk and you need to eat your vegetables. <laughs> and I hate that I have to be the non-fun one. But like, you, yeah, like as, as a, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a progressive, but like it sucks saying, sorry, you can't lower the taxes because of course you want, everybody wants lower taxes, of course. But Mm -hmm. there are real repercussions. We're going to have to close the school in April. (laughs) We've just spoken like generally about government ideology, you know, the different alternatives that are available. And now we'd actually like to focus on the Tea Party, (laughs) the thing that the episode is actually about. Now that we've now that we've like table set. So let's get into the ideology of the Tea Party itself as a movement. And I think we should start with the Santelli rant. We don't need to like play it live and live react to it, but pretty good rant though. You gotta, you gotta give it to him. It's a pretty good rant. It's a great rant. Yeah. <laughs> the fucking Chicago accent. Yeah. You don't wanna be paying for your neighbor's mortgage <laughs> who's got an extra bathroom. <laughs> It is not that strong, but I like that you hammed it up. Yeah, there's this day trader who goes on a rant against this. Obama has like just been sworn in. And there's this one teeny tiny little provision in the bailout actually help people with their mortgages, mortgage remediations. It is a drop in the bucket of the actual bill. And it it actually failed. If you look at the footnote of Frank's book, they're like, oh, yeah, it was so watered down and so toothless that the government actually wasn't even able to enforce these regulations. So it actually didn't even help anyone. But Santelli goes off on this rant at the fact that some people are getting some kind of mortgage help. And I think he closes by saying, we're going to have our own little Boston Tea Party here in Chicago. And this, this is seen as the birth of the movement, the reaction against Obama in the form of the Tea Party. It starts off with one Chicago asshole, pretty appropriate considering where Obama's from, saying your mortgage is not my problem. And it's this weird little muddling that he does, that the whole movement does, which is that the small businessman, that's a yeoman farmer. The day trader is no different than a guy working on the assembly line. We are the little guy who has, you know, the jackboot of the state on our neck. We're just trying to make a humble living. This is one of the many switcheroos at the heart of the ideology of the Tea Party. And literally, they're out there saying capitalism isn't the problem. True capitalism has never been tried. (laughs) It's pretty much the ideology of the Tea Party because they have this big contradiction to address. You, free market neolibs, have gotten everything everything you fucking wanted for the past 50 goddamn years and it brought us here. Explain that away. And of course they can't. So what they say is that, uh, no we didn't. No it wasn't. That wasn't us. Those were all secret socialists. This is where we start to hear words like rhino thrown around, a Republican in name only. When they're faced with ugly truths, like after the AIG bailout, they get all this taxpayer money. AIG pays out $160 million worth of bonuses and people are rightly pissed off about this. They need to explain this away through the rule of law, right? Well, listen, you may not like it, but contracts, rule of law, this shit matters. So at its core, the Tea Party is first and foremost a rhetorical exercise to take this popular anger and redirect the blame away from the people who are most culpable, the bankers and finance, and direct it towards the people who could, maybe, in an ideal world, help, i.e. the government. I think it might be illustrative to read one of the treatises from Glenn Beck, who was one of the leaders of the Tea Party movement. Yeah, he wrote a book called Common Sense. 
which obviously, you know, he says it's inspired by Thomas Paine. And it was really illustrative to me of like how these people thought because I didn't realize like what psychos they were. <laughs> they really don't believe in any government intervention at all. Glenn Beck comes out against public education. He comes out for homeschooling. I thought there was like a limit to what extent they thought that the government should do nothing. Obviously, it, it doesn't apply to like public school or environmental protections. And it's like, no, no, they're, these people like want to live in an anarchist society with except with the exception of the police, obviously, like the police and the military. <laughs> Anarcho-capitalist society. Enough, yeah. The thing that they could see themselves benefiting from, <laughs> that was okay. If I'm mm -hmm. getting it, it's fine. But if yeah. anyone else is getting it and I'm not, no, absolutely not. Or if there's just a perception that it's going to somehow benefit some other person more than me, that's got to go. I'm not in grade seven. Why the fuck should I be paying a grade <laughs> seven teacher? <laughs> teach English to some little kid. We have a little reading series prepared for you. I always love when podcasts I listen to do reading series. So I thought it might be fun to read some selections from Glenn Beck's book, Common Sense. So this chapter is called The Cancer of Progressivism. Progressivism has less to do with parties and more to do with individuals who seek to redefine, reshape, and rebuild America into a country where individual liberties and personal property mean nothing if they conflict with the plans and goals of the state. For example, consider George W. Bush's defense of the massive wealth redistribution that took place through his Medicare prescription drug benefit plan, Part D. If you're a low-income senior, he said, the government's going to pick up a significant portion of your tab. If you're an average income senior, you're going to see your drug bills cut in half. That should have been a marching order to Americans to go back and read the history of the early 20th century progressive movement. Even John McCain once said that Teddy Roosevelt was one of his favorite presidents. And you still wonder why it feels like elections offer us no real choice. These candidates may come from different political parties, but their philosophy of government's role is all from the same corrupt well. Wow. Yeah, he's coming out against Teddy Roosevelt as being too progressive. <laughs> he wants to turn back the clock. You know, this is exactly what I'm saying. We're two times in that thing. He had to say this has nothing to do with parties. It's like they're all progressives. George W. Bush, progressive. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's so fucking funny that he he literally needs to say part C in this watered down <laughs> prescription benefit thing. Like that's how into the weeds he is, where he's like the means tested prescription benefit for middle income owners is essentially Mussolini's march on Rome. <laughs> You usually need to study your early 20th century history if you don't see the connection. <laughs> Prescriptions for seniors? Come on, man. <laughs> is that like, again, why have a country? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly, that's what I was thinking when you were reading that. Is, yeah, why have a country? What are they proposing as the alternative? That we all just live in Gatorade? Is that the idea? <laughs> like, I live in a place called Gatorade because that's the Omnicorp that happens to be closest to me and therefore I fall under their, you know, jurisdiction. Whatever. Yeah, their jurisdiction. <laughs> Like, what is the point? What is the end goal of doing away with all government? Kyle, what's it going to take to get you in a compound today? I got a new <laughs> compound to sell you. <laughs> Okay, I'll continue here. The presidential election of 2008 was truly a repeat of the presidential election of 1912, in which America was really only offered a progressive Republican and a progressive Democrat as candidates. Parallels between the current president and those of our progressive forefathers aren't hard to find. Woodrow Wilson once said, we must demand that the individual shall be willing to lose the sense of personal achievement and shall be content to realize his activity only in connection to the activity of the many. Well, that sounds a lot like President Obama's campaign answer to Joe the Plum who was told that his taxes would rise. It's not that I want to punish you for your success, Obama <laughs> told him. I just want to make sure that everyone who is behind you, that they've got a chance to success too. And I think when you spread the wealth around, it's good for everybody. Over the last century, progressives have successfully moved our country towards more government control, less personal freedom, and they're still pushing the envelope. Freedom to what? Less personal freedom to what? I kept what, thinking what about freedoms? the shirtwaist factory fire when he said this. It's like, <laughs> this is the economic freedom that he's talking about. He's like, the freedom to lock your employees in the building. <laughs> <laughs> Because that's what Teddy Roosevelt or like Woodrow Wilson, what are the real restrictions that those guys were putting on business at the time, right? Yeah. That's the regulations we're talking. The freedom to cut down redwood trees and mine the Grand Canyon. Oh, he'll get to that. <laughs> yeah. The freedom to employ a six-year-old in my uh, <laughs> Exactly. Imagine thinking that the progressive business regulations of the 1900s went too far. 
<laughs> and there's something I want to notice also as we go through this. One of the major ideological components of the Tea Party is that on either side of the coin, it is apocalyptic fear, which we have here in the references to early 20th century, like fascism movements, because he's going to allied progressivism and fascism into the same thing. If I recall my Beck, uh, if, if we are upholding <laughs> Be- Becky in thought. So it's apocalyptic fear on the one hand, which again, we had such watered down non-action from the government. It boggles the mind to hold these two ideas at once, that this was the cause for this apocalyptic fear and death panels and all that shit. Mm. And then the flip side of the coin is going to be this utopian answer, that the answer is pure free markets. Mm -hmm. Pure uncut ideology. (laughs) (laughs) The principles of freedom and liberty and the beliefs of our founding fathers have basically been whitewashed from the curriculum. Progressives view the Constitution as a living, breathing organism that evolves with time and changes depending on the circumstances. The battle between these two philosophies is taking place right now in a few key issues that progressives are using to drive their agenda forward. The environment, gun control, education, and religion. So this is his bid on the environment. At first glance, climate change and going green don't seem like issues that relate to the battle playing out for our country's soul. But if you back away and see the forest instead of a bunch of individual trees... Uh, If you back away and and see what used to be the forest. (laughs) (laughs) Oh yeah, he comes out big against trees in this next paragraph. (laughs) They gotta go. Uh, You quickly realize what's really going on here. Leaders who want more government control over business, economy, and personal lives can't simply snap their fingers and get it. They need a vehicle to get them there. And my contention is that climate change is that vehicle. So the green movement isn't about saving the planet. It's about government control. I don't know if you guys knew this. Of course. Yeah. yeah. Now, th- this this actually is surprising because you still hear this, right? You still hear this from like the Jordan Peterson world. It's such an interesting inversion of the idea of like uh, the shock doctrine, you know, where governments take advantage of these horrible natural disasters or other huge uh, crises to inflict horrendous legal changes and things like that on people and regime changes. I don't know. It's just so fascinating to hear it apply to things that are real and have nothing to do with the government. Like just being like, oh yeah, no, no, no. This They're just using this. Like it's so fascinating because it's the same people who actually do the shock doctrine stuff, but everything comes down to projection. It's always just like, mm-hmm. well, they're doing the thing. They're doing that actually. Yep. It's not us. They're yep. doing it. And this oh, time yeah. it's the tree. Yeah. <laughs> projection is the key word for these motherfuckers, right? <laughs> and there's no logic loop there. It's like, okay, the planet is burning. We need to fix it. Okay, Mm -hmm. we need to enforce some kind of protections. Oh, that means more government control. You just want this for control. It's like, okay, fine, we won't do it because it just like you can never get to a solution from that then because it's like, yes, government control is going to be necessary. Even if I don't want it, I I want what I want is the protection of the environment. I don't care how it happens. (laughs) But don't you know, Giordano, those poor mining CEOs didn't have all these regulators (laughs) breathing down their back. I'm sure they'd come up with a pretty clever idea to deal with all the runoff. (laughs) They're just too busy sorting through all the paperwork they have to do. for the freaking EPA inspector. The conservation movement came into its own during the progressive period. Teddy Roosevelt proclaimed there can be no greater issue than that of conservation in this country. Well, today we have Al Gore preaching the same gospel to a different audience about global warming. Do these men truly believe what they're saying? Do they honestly believe that the environment can really be protected through government intervention? Or is the environment just a vehicle towards the progressive ideal of total government control? Okay, so Teddy Roosevelt made the national parks to have more government control. He actually didn't want to protect the parks or like leave them as a place free from profit where people could visit the natural beauty of the earth. I don't know if you guys knew that. Teddy Roosevelt was not acting in good faith. That's not what he wanted. He actually just wanted more government control as an idea, as an abstract thought. Yeah, he just got off on it. He just likes sitting back at his desk and thinking about all those redwoods that he now owns. Yeah, and you want to talk about projection, right? The Tea Party movement deals with capitalism entirely as an abstract. Where talk about the environment. Let's look at an environmental catastrophe that happened around this time that was the cause of actually existing capitalism. The fucking deep water horizon spill, right? That was caused by like under regulation and too much mining. They shouldn't have been mining that far out. Didn't have enough people to investigate. Toothless regulators. They don't mention that. They just deal entirely in the abstract notion of a free market and yeah, just pure like utopian zealotry. Like it would be better if it were free. Never mind the fact that 
we've had 50 years of these policies and it has unquestionably been a failure. Was deep water when, did they shoot ping pong balls into it or something? <laughs> Am I misremembering that? that was, I don't know. I think that was one of the solutions they did. I feel like there was something like that where they just, the solution was, we're going to get a lot of ping pong balls and we're just going to go down there and plug that hole. Bada boom, bada bing. Yeah, as, as a, a burgeoning adult, I feel like that was like a key moment for me, like specifically that the harebrained <laughs> ping pong approach that I think was probably an early like key moment in, in the pulling back of the veil of, of just the insanity of, of everything, of how the, the numbskullery that is how all these things function. I feel like that was a very important thing for me to be like, OK, I, I don't know anything about anything, but this can't <laughs> this can't be it. And like, that's this what is- he, he's never prescriptive in this stuff, right? It's always just like you have to just trust that the free market will do the right thing. But it's like there is no free market solution to environmental protectionism, right? There is no one to advocate for the environment. The environment isn't a force that operates in the economy. Like, what is your solution? There are externalities associated with polluting. It benefits you at the cost of the environment. There's like a free rider problem. There's a tragedy of the commons. What solution are you offering for environmental protections? Because as it exists right now, there are no market solutions for that. It's not profitable. It, yes. Yeah. Protecting the environment is not profitable. So it's not going to get done in a free market. So, so what is your solution in the Ayn Rand world of protecting the environment? There is none. Unless you're selling <laughs> ping pong balls, in which case... <laughs> Although I just looked it up. It's actually golf balls. Okay. So that's fine. And bad. even uh, when they try to offer private opportunities to protect the environment, he's against them. So I'll move on to that here. Like Gore, Roosevelt didn't just use words. He demanded action. He limited personal freedom and ignored states' rights by giving government more power over water and grazing rights and creating over 50 bird preserves through executive <laughs> order. And with the stroke of a pen, established more than 20 <laughs> national forests. It didn't matter that businesses and individuals were negatively impacted by each of these decisions, Roosevelt <laughs> argued that it put the greatest good for the greatest number. It required action. The new nationalism, he said, puts the national need before the sectional and personal advantage. This man is coming out against bird prison. <laughs> <laughs> 50 bird sanctuaries. If it were 10, if it were 20, you know, vile con Dios, but 50 is too many birds. It's funny that the classic reactionary joke is that like, ah, but we live in a society. And like Glenn Beck is somehow the opposite of that. Like, ah, but I refuse society. It's just amazing. Like his argument is literally, we should not do We should any kill of the, the birds. That- yeah, fuck the birds. They they offer no GDP. <laughs> there, there's no one advocating on their behalf. Therefore, they're worthless because they don't, ha- they can't hire lawyers to advocate for themselves. Man, the scariest movie for Glenn Beck must be Star Trek II, colon, The Wrath of Khan, because in his dying breath, Spock says, sometimes the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few or the one. <laughs> yeah, my man loves Ghostbusters, though. <laughs> Literally, what what are the things that separate us from just being cavemen? <laughs> Hitting each other in the head <laughs> with sticks. Like, honestly. I say let the free market the, decide like, who gets bonked on the head. What they are against... <laughs> But basically what he's arguing is like, let's take all the things that differentiate us from being <laughs> savage animals. And, you know, I think we'll be fine. The monument, the the big glistening obelisk, mm. <laughs> socialist intervention. We never should have touched the obelisk. <laughs> The progressives tricked us on that one. Yeah, getting back to Beck. We hear the same arguments today. Politicians lecture us that jobs must be sacrificed and factories must be closed for the greater good. We are told that we can't drill for oil or burn clean coal because of environmental impacts. We are told by our president we can't drive our SUVs and eat as much as we want or keep our homes at 72 degrees all the time. Words that eerily echo Teddy Roosevelt's call for a new spirit of service. Okay, wait, hold on. What is 72 in Celsius? It's, it's more than warm enough. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a, it's a straw man argument. No one is telling you to, to not keep your home at uh, 72 totally degrees. Insane. Anyway, okay, moving on. Yeah, it, it, this man is opposed to the concept of service. This is wild for a man who says he's like a Mormon. They're so community oriented, those motherfuckers. I don't understand. If you were to talk to most conservatives and you, would, and you were to say like conservatism is a cult of selfishness, they would be offended. They'd be like, no, we support the fucking family and intimate ties or whatever the fuck. But like this man is 
literally opposed to service. He hates America, I think. <laughs> Obama set up a volunteer program for America and he rips on it because Obama, I think if you did like a year of service, Obama made it possible for you to get two or three thousand dollars. And he's like, well, why are they really doing it? It's like, <laughs> man, there are easier ways to make two or three thousand dollars. Yeah, that is a bad deal. <laughs> OK, we are told that humans are destroying the planet and that only scientists, quote unquote, the experts, question mark, <laughs> <laughs> that Congress was going green by replacing 12,000 incandescent light bulbs with environmentally friendly compact fluorescent ones. Trees would be planted and carbon offsets would be purchased. Congress purchased close to $90,000 worth of carbon credits to offset the lights. Those credits allow for an entity to emit carbon in exchange for paying another entity to plant trees or sequestering carbon monoxide, thereby eliminating or reducing the same amount of carbon. You give someone $1,000 to plant 10 trees, but later find out that they planted those trees five years ago, have you really done anything to help the environment or are you just helping your own conscious? Yes, motherfucker, because they only planted those trees with the expectation that they would be able to sell them later. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> But to be honest, this is one of those funny, like, broken clock things in that he's accidentally correct that carbon offsets are sort of a shitty way to deal with climate change and things like that. Of course, him, you know, also supposing that the correct way is to do nothing at all and actually just fucking pedal to the metal. Let's, well, it's because know. we are willing to placate these people and say, OK, we know that you love the free market. Maybe we could come up with like a free market solution to helping the environment with this carbon trading program. Right. It's like the, the free market ideology applied to global warming. And even there, they're like, no, fuck you. This isn't <laughs> acceptable. Unless I can eat whole directly <laughs> from a bowl like it's fucking breakfast cereal, this is tyranny. <laughs> this is my favorite part coming up here. He says, the hubris, arrogance, and hypocrisy of politicians has no limits. Mentality taking us down a subtle road to tyranny. I present to you the light bulb lie. Warning, <laughs> this product contains a chemical known to the state of California to cause cancer. Sounds like a nasty, dangerous product, right? It is. The product is mercury, and it can be toxic which is why California wanted those two warnings on cans of tuna. But if mercury is so dangerous, then why would Congress require mercury-filled light bulbs to be used in our homes, offices, and churches? Compact fluorescent light bulbs contain an average of four milligrams of mercury each, far more than the 12 milligrams contained in a light can of tuna. <laughs> Are you eating the light bulbs? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. To point out that there's more mercury in a light bulb than a can of tuna is just like... <laughs> It's very funny to invoke whatever the California law is that that means that things actually have to yeah. tell you that there's poison in them because what that does and what that has done is <laughs> revealed to everybody that, oh, because of all this deregulation and because things are just made for the cheapest possible way and, and no care put into making sure that things are pure, or don't have toxins and poisons, every single thing <laughs> that we interact with in our environments is now <laughs> made of poison. But I love the idea of being like, hey, this law makes me have to think about the fact that everything I touch is killing me and the problem <laughs> is the law. That's the issue here. Let me live in ignorance eating my mercury without thinking about it. <laughs> Just let me eat my goddamn light bulbs in peace. Oh, that was my favorite. Just him coming out against mercury warnings on his tuna. <laughs> because technically the light bulbs you're making me install have more mercury than a single can of tuna. <laughs> yeah, it, it is a rhetorical masterclass. <laughs> Each and every feel-good environmental policy has a price attached to it. Politicians never talk about the cost of carbon credits, but not talking about it doesn't make the cost any less real. For example, <laughs> Professor Thomas Sowell talks about how homes were far more expensive in cities and towns that adopted environmental policies. Why? Because supply and demand. By imposing an artificial restriction on development, the cost of building rose. It's another example of the difference between feeling and thinking. It feels good, but once you think about it, there's a substantial hidden cost. <laughs> it's like, or maybe the houses were more expensive because the ground wasn't poisoned and you weren't <laughs> surrounded by libertarian fucking assholes. <laughs> Also, just as someone who's a bit of a, full disclosure to the listener, I'm a bit of a train psycho. I'm a bit of an urbanist train and cycling and housing psycho. You, you want to talk about a market distortion in how we build housing? How about parking minimums? That's a huge cost. That's a market distortion. <laughs> what about zoning laws that make it that we can only build single family homes? What about the fact that 50% of all residential land in America is zoned exclusively for single family homes? Like, these are the regulations that I care about is the stuff that makes housing more scarce and 
cultivates tremendous car dependency because car lobbyists and oil lobbyists like the status quo. We never hear about that. It's about the moderate arsenic testing we're going to do in the backyard. That's what's <laughs> driving up the cost of housing. Mm-hmm. Fuck off. <laughs> One of my favorite Glenn Beck things is that idea of, you know, he comes out and he says, failing is a necessary step to achieving success. And these regulations and these bailouts, they sidestep that. They sidestep the failure. The things don't get better. And it's like, normally when people invoke that idea of, you know, you need to fail, it's it's sort of supposed to be like an inspirational thing. Like, hey, you know, keep keep your shin up. There's going to be bumps on the road, but every setback is a way to learn. And then, you'll, you know, keep, keep at it and you'll get better. He's like completely conflating it with the idea of, oh, you got to break a few <laughs> eggs to make an omelet. And like in his story, it's not like I have to fail to get better. It's you have to fail so that I can keep making money or keep whatever. So it just reminded me of these like Tesla mm-hmm. psychos who are like on Twitter all day arguing like, no, actually, it's good that uh, Tesla's uh, <laughs> killing toddlers because <laughs> every toddler that ricochets <laughs> off one of their bumpers brings them one step closer to uh, being able to tell the difference between a toddler and a pylon. And you know, when I'm driving my Tesla, I want it to be able to navigate the pylons. Uh, so, you know, a couple, you got to break a couple toddlers uh, to make a, a pylon. Well, yeah, here. that's the that's the utopian side of the Tea Party free market ideology. The apocalyptic side is that the government is going to become tyrannical and fascistic and Obama Joker is gonna fucking send you to a death panel, right? That's the fear, the apocalyptic fear that got people out protesting and voting and writing books and speeches or whatever, doing all the Tea Party thing. And then the utopian side is everything you just said. Like, listen, yes, there is pain in the pure free market, but in the long term, it's always better. In the long term, it's always utopian. And if you graft this ideology onto something of social decline, it's always like America's been living beyond its means for too long. Not enough people have faced any consequences. And that's part of the brilliant redirection because that's the kernel of truth. The finance sector did not face any consequences. And so we need to punish everyday homeowners, right? Like that's the great switcheroo, the fucking three card Monty, the shell game, whatever you want to call it, but just redirecting the legitimate anger and using both fear and utopianism to get you there. The education part, all you need to know, Glenn Beck, very anti-public school, very pro homeschooling. He thinks that the reason why Detroit's public school system struggled to have 25% of students qualify for high school diploma is because they're all Montessori schools now where they talk about their feelings and about how the, how bad America is. <laughs> That's why people in Detroit aren't graduating high school. It's not because of, you know, the socioeconomic conditions that the suburbs forced on them. It's that they're Montessori schools. Like our parents and grandparents, most of us grew up in an era when schools sought to instill confidence and respect in our government and its leaders. We learned of the selflessness of George Washington and the honesty of Abraham Lincoln. We learned how our country came together to crush Nazism and fascism and put a man on the moon. The knowledge of those events and our government's proud role in them inspired us. We are losing the next generation to an educational system that has fallen prey to the progressive agenda. History, reading, writing, math are all secondary to the indoctrination of our kids against climate change and the evils of capitalism. During the 1900s, progressive increased the mandatory nature of education, which resulted in enrollment for high school age children going up, right? Along with public school spending, Mm. the progressives didn't want learning to be from teachers to students. They wanted it to be based on the children's own feelings, which is why the Detroit public school system struggles to have 25% of its students qualify for a diploma. Hitler told his supporters (laughs) that those in, (laughs) of course, Hitler told his supporters that those opposing the Third Reich and its ideologies were destined to fail because as he put it, your child belongs to us already. And that child will grow up to know the new camp in which he is being raised. More recently, Hillary Clinton pronounced that it takes a village to raise a child, (laughs) suggesting that the community has a vested interest in deciding that what each child is taught and how or she is raised. They bought into the classroom community concept and urged our teachers to act as friends to children. The truth is that all of these attempts to take care of your children are nothing more than an effort to break down the cohesion and structure of the parent-child relationship, while also migrating power to a national or global entity. The progressive recognizes that the family is the basic, most fundamental building block of society, and they realize that by degrading the power of the parents, they are establishing in the minds of children the power and compassion of the state. So the school is there to break down the bond between parent and child and replace it with a bond between the child and the state. And I was reading this and I just couldn't help but think of 
of like Afghanistan <laughs> when I was reading this because he could have become a leader of a tribal society, honestly. <laughs> this focus on the family over the power of the state. Yeah, it's like Afghanistan, it's Somalia, it's some cults with compounds. You know? it's, a, it's such a depressingly narcissistic, individual atomized view of what the world should be. I guess I also struggle to see what is the appeal to any of this? Who reads this and is like, you know what I fucking hate? Friends. <laughs> I fucking hate having people in my life who care about me, who were going to be mutually there for one another during difficult times. I fucking hate that person who comes over and brought me cookies when I was like feeling down. <laughs> what an asshole trying to get between me and whatever. Like, it's, like who who wants this for themselves? Who's like, I need to be more alone. I need to have no one looking out for me, responsible for no one and just fucking sad lone wolf. It's such a bizarre. I really have a hard time empathizing with this mindset it's the sigma male mindset <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah just fucking leg day every day don't talk to me don't look at me yeah it's wild you are the yeoman farmer who set out into the untamed west and lived in like that is the greatest figure i think in american culture to them is the settlers who went out west and lived outside of the reach of government yeah or the plantation owners <laughs> or the plantation right? owners. Like, yeah, yeah. you want to be able to use the power of a finance and economy to make people do stuff for you. You just don't want to be told what to do, right? That's a one-way street there. Yeah, they can't say like, I want I want to have a slave. <laughs> they, they know they can't say that, but they can say, I want to have a teenager do all the work for me for $3 an hour. <laughs> that would be good. The damn government's stopping me. Okay, let's wrap up. Oh, you know what though? We didn't talk about the 912 project, which is one of the funniest Yeah, I do have, that is like my next to. note here is that Glenn Beck is obsessed with 912, the day after 9-11, because it was a day that we were all united United. His quote is, do you remember when Americans lined up to donate blood? Do you remember when the following Sunday's football games were postponed? That late night comedians deferred their jokes and that even trial lawyers respected a self-imposed moratorium on terrorist lawsuits. Okay, this sounds like service, what? Glenn Beck. This sounds like <laughs> the greater good. What are you talking about? This sounds like putting your own needs below the needs of others. <laughs> mm -hmm. We were all united. Kyle, we said this on the uh, American Idiot episode that you were on, which is that we were all united in bloodlust. Yeah, it's <laughs> yes. let's kill someone. Well, that's the thing. It's both, if you take it at face value, completely contradictory to everything he's been saying. Mm -hmm. He's saying like, let's come together, let's find community, all these things that he has been making it very clear that he is not in support of. And it is also pure fantasy. What he is invoking there, everyone woke up on September 12th and said, I just need to, to be with my fellow man. <laughs> that's my main impulse right now. And that's what the government was saying. And our leaders were saying, they were saying, let's just come together as America and focus on us. That's what everyone said. Let's just <laughs> let's just take a little bit of a little bit of us time right now. <laughs> yeah, no, his worldview is that he wishes it was September 12th every day. That's what he wants is that for us to feel like we did it right after 9-11. That's what he wants us to feel like every single day. <laughs> Just bathed in in trauma and fear and uh, righteous, holy anger <laughs> at uh, anybody again who is remotely tanned. That's what that's what we're going for here. Hilarious. Let's attack Sikhs because I, they kind of look like the people who we think did this. So actually, a fan reached out to us to point out that John Stewart mocked the protesters who were protesting the war in Afghanistan. That's how united we were. One of Glenn Beck's big points in his book, too, was that in order to keep the rule of law, we had to pay out those bankers bonuses with the bailout money because it was in their contract that if they sold a certain number of these mortgage backed securities, then they would get the bonus. So he's like, it's actually like a rule of law thing and we have to pay them their bonuses. Anyway, so yeah, well, let's get back to the Tea Party. We kind of explained earlier, they had this cognitive dissonance because to them, America means free market business. And yet now America is going through this horrible financial crisis that seems to have spawned from deregulation. And so we want to get back to our ideals that the founding fathers came up with, right? And they treat the constitution as a religious document and the founding fathers as saints or the apostles. They could never be wrong. Everything that we need now in our current situation is in that constitution. Some Something that, by the way, I will point out that all of the people who wrote the Constitution would have been described as liberals, as classical liberals <laughs> in their day. When they were inventing that. So Glenn Beck was a radio talk show host who was on CNN for a bit. He was kind of a middling guy. Then he moved to Fox News in 2009. A real right place, right time. Highly conspiratorial, super right wing, libertarian, Mormon, and a recovering alcoholic, actually. And Glenn Beck is kind of the, the intellectual mind and the beating heart of the Tea Party. 
party movement. And he was on every day at 5 p.m. on Fox News for the olds. <laughs> and to call him unhinged is, I would say, a charitable turn of <laughs> phrase for him. His whole shtick, if if you haven't seen it, is he goes on these rambling, like Jordana said, crescendoing monologues that often invoked a whiteboard or a, a chalkboard. Mm-hmm. And he would just maniacally scribble and be drawing lines. It's exactly like Charlie and um, it's like Pepe Sylvia, just these webs of things and everything always connected to like Marxism and right. Obama. See, see, as he frantically pieces of chalk just flying across the room as he goes. And it's quite amazing to go back and watch the clips and realize how much of America's brains were stewing in that on a daily basis. We'll get to the echoes today, but when you want to talk about the nascent conspiratorial culture we live in now, it's like, oh, this guy was the real harbinger of that. Yeah, we're wrapping up our section on the ideology of the Tea Party. So we've hit a lot of our notes. I think one thing worth stressing is how not concerned with social issues they were. So this movement eventually starts getting sites and thinkers, but much like a leftist group, there's a lot of cells of the Tea Party. There isn't really one top-down organization that organized all these guys. And so what's unique about this conservative ascendancy of the Tea Party in 2009-10 is that social issues took a total backseat. We had social issues before. We were talking about welfare queens and super predators. And of course, after we talk about transing the kids and CRT and groomers and all that shit. But right here in the middle is this moment where the site Tea Party Patriots asked that people refrain from discussing social issues and maintained this discussion of Ayn Rand style libertarian economics. And I think a huge part of this is that this movement had its backers in the form of the Koch brothers and a whole bunch of other rich right wing billionaire types bankrolling behind the scenes. They don't want to talk about social issues. They want to win elections and social issues can be divisive. So we're going to keep talking about economic issues that most directly benefit. And that's, I think that's an important thing we haven't talked about yet is the way that really from the outset, this supposedly grassroots movement is like entirely astroturfed. This is a movement that is funded by these shadowy freedom works and Americans for Prosperity and like Cato all these Institute, uh, Heritage Foundation, yeah. Yeah, so many. <laughs> these advocacy groups that don't have to disclose their donors, but like everyone knows is tied to yeah, all these psycho billionaires that fund all of this conservative People shit. who stand to benefit from deregulation. Yes. Yeah, surprise. <laughs> it's interesting to think of the early days of it because you know that these billionaires, like any good uh, investor, they're going to want to diversify their portfolios. So they're, they've got money that they put into all these different groups and all these different things. What's the thing that gets all these the psycho judges elected now? Federalist Society? They've got this money that they know they can put out and they'll get some returns here and there. The Federalist Society, where they know if we put enough money behind that, we're going to get some legislation in place that's favorable for us. And it's funny to think that what became such a big movement really might have just started as, I don't know, another pot to put some money in. We'll see what we get out mm-hmm. of that. But this is a movement that just happened to right place, right time, really take off and kind of run away with itself. But that fundamentally, at least at its outset, this was not really a populist movement. I guess you could argue it became one, but really this was a constructed thing from the very beginning. Yeah, I would argue it, it was absolutely guided and constructed. There was legitimate anger and they managed to redirect it. It's an exercise in mystification. That's what Thomas Frank keeps calling it. It's muddling. It's mystification. People were pissed and people's lives were getting harder and they got hoodwinked and swindled into thinking that regulation was the problem. And one of the things that when we compare, you know, the book makes a lot of comparisons, very apt ones to the 1930s and and the Great Depression is like one thing that's different about then and now is then it was a lot easier, I think, as an average person to be like, oh, the banks fucked up and the, the bankers and these financial elites or whatever term you want to use, they messed up and now I'm suffering. And because of all the deregulation that's happened in the middle and just the obfuscation and and how confusing our financial system has become, one of the key things is that people just literally didn't know what happened. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, the stock market crashes, the value of their homes are crashing. All these things that they had been told was never going to happen. Don't worry. Like, fuck it. The line only goes (laughs) up. We're going to be fine. Suddenly this happens. And so one thing that's really different, I think, is that for the average person, there was a genuine confusion and a genuine sense of how did this happen? How could this have happened? Because no one knows what a default credit swap is. <laughs> credit default swap. And, and, and that's by design. <laughs> fuck, fuck. 
<laughs> well, point proven. <laughs> and so I think the way that people are going through this would have literally been looking to the government, at least initially, to be like, what happened? Tell us, who should we be murdering with our pitchforks? <laughs> would have been like a genuine question people had. And this is where the Democrats and leftists really at large completely failed to step up and provide any education, provide any sense to people of this is your enemy. This is who did this to you. And that's what left the gap for these grifters to come in and say, uh, it was regulations. It was literally telling people the exact opposite of what happened. But because people were just desperate for something, they yeah, kind of they offered a it. vision, which I think we'll, we'll get to when we close. But yeah, talk about the left fumbling. Obama's on the record. He had a delegation of bankers come to the White House and he was on the record saying, I am the only thing standing between you and the pitchforks. I'm sorry, is that your role? <laughs> <laughs> Before we move on Friday, LG, what is the Tea Party? Why do they call themselves that? Why does the group exist in this symbolic form with the tricolor hats? And, you know, after this this rant from this uh, noble Italian man in Chicago, <laughs> people got to thinking that like, hey, you know, our country is great. It's the greatest country on earth. It's built on this founding myth of our founding fathers and our constitution, which is the best in the world. Never needs to be changed. It's a religious document. Number Let's one, get back baby. to that. What made our country great for George Washington can also make us great. Liberal economic policies of Adam Smith. And, and so they use the imagery of the American Revolution. They call back on the Boston Tea Party, which was a revolt on a form of government intervention, I guess, in the form of tariffs. And they run with this idea that, hey, America is the greatest country on earth and uh, it's because of our ideals and we need to stick to those ideals and not do healthcare reform and not do <laughs> bank bailouts. And it is funny that they're obsessed with the Constitution to the point that they consider it like a religious document because the person they hate the most in the world is Barack Obama, who is a literal constitutional law professor. <laughs> and it's like, why do they think he studied the Constitution for so long? Like, was he just looking for loopholes? Like, like <laughs> he was studying. Yeah, know your enemy, Giordano. Your enemy is a Constitution. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So this movement starts out by having little rallies in public parks and town squares. Like the first Tea Party rally literally happens one month into Obama's term. This thing starts early. And then by the summer of 2010, they are going hard. And they took a real active movement in the primary season. They would crash Republican town halls, ask crazy questions. We had some Tea Party candidates unseat some more moderate, you know, traditional Chamber of Commerce style Republicans. And, and in 2010, the Republicans take back the House after only four years of Democratic control in this massive landslide. And a lot of people point to the Tea Party as a huge part of generating this electoral victory that would eventually go on to really hamstring Obama for the rest of his presidency. And the movement was so potent within the party that there was a Tea Party caucus, a formal segment of the Republican Party called the Tea Party Caucus, led by Michelle Bachman, that kicked around from 2010 to 2016. And for some reason, something happened in 2016. I'm not quite sure what. Mm -hmm. And then there was no more Tea Party Caucus anymore. The one thing we, we haven't really said yet is the degree to which, yes, it framed itself as being a one issue movement, you know, no, no government intervention. But I think it is worth talking about why it's Obama. And we alluded to the, you know, his terrifying middle name, but it's not a coincidence that a black man is in charge and this huge upswell happens. And I think there is an undercurrent to all of this, that it's the jazz thing of the notes they're not <laughs> playing. Uh, the racisms they're not saying, uh, the gamer words they're not saying. <laughs> Part of what drives this is this fear that like the white middle class as a vague concept is somehow under threat and, and somehow there are outside actors who are trying to come in and change things to take away our power. And one of the things that they were so pissed about, any possibility that someone's mortgage might somehow be alleviated or changed so that they might be able to make payments was this idea that it would unfairly help minorities or would unfairly help poor people and the specific way that they just couldn't handle the idea of not just that someone would get something that they couldn't, but someone who's perceived as lesser than for all these different reasons would, would get things yeah, they would. I definitely see that there's some of it there, but the libs dismiss the Tea Party movement entirely of, oh, they're all just racist, right? They totally ignored the things that the Tea Partiers were saying, the things that both the average people who were at rallies, as well as their article head backers who were writing articles about how great this was, or the fucking Sarah Palins of the world who came and talked at Tea Party conferences that cost $500 a plate to attend, the whole you know apparatus of grifters. I think there definitely was a racial element to it, but I think dismissing the entire movement 
resentment as like, oh, yeah, that's just white resentment. That's how we end up with Trump again. I think the door was left cracked open for the Tea Party because the left did such a fucking bad job on the economic front, on explaining what happened, on addressing the issues, on not putting any conditions on the bailout. That left this massive gap for the Tea Party to exploit. Like there was something that they were offering people. They offered a vision of the world of both fear and utopia, free market utopia. Yeah, I know. And I'm not saying that's the whole thing, but I I think it's an element. I don't think it's a coincidence that uh, the demographic is what it is. Trump is going to pass even larger government budgets and like run the deficit just as much as Obama, as his Joe Brandon. And he never really had the same kind of movement erupt. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think Ben's right that I feel like it was a really missed opportunity because I don't remember anyone saying, okay, let's have a conversation about the role of government intervention in society. What would you have hoped people did during the Great Depression? And instead it was like, oh, well, you know, they're, they're just racist. Okay, let's move on to what did the Tea Party do? What did they accomplish? What were the real world consequences? So like I said, a bunch of rallies all over the place, including one big one in Washington across the street from the White House as Obama was trying to get Obamacare over the finish line. And I think you can point to the Tea Party as a huge element of Obama watering down that health care legislation. Got rid of the public option, right? That was originally in the Affordable Care Act. It was a huge, huge concession, essentially, to people on the right. Yeah, the Tea Party was the one who made us all start talking about death panels, right? This was a huge part of their thing. Like A whole part of their raison d'etre was Obamacare. And here are what some of the voices from the Tea Party right said about the Affordable Care Act. This shitty, watered-down mandate that you go buy insurance from private insurance. Glenn Beck called it, quote, the end of America as you know it. Rush Limbaugh said it was robbing you of your humanity. And then another right-wing radio talk person said the ACA is also the end of the Republic. So this was probably their big crowning achievement. The Tea Party is a huge part of the reason that your healthcare still sucks. And if we zoom out for a second, what started as your mortgage is not my problem, let them fail. Anger Mm. at the soft treatment of bankers has turned into your healthcare is not my problem. Your cancer is not my problem. (laughs) It's essentially what they're saying, right? It's it's uh, yeah. psychotic. Again, why have mm-hmm. a country? And, you know, there's two ways to take Obama's reaction to the Tea Party, right? You can assume that the Tea Party actually affected him and his ability to pass meaningful legislation, which is probably the lib view of it. I did read through Obama's autobiography to see what he said about the Tea Party. And he does mention it a few times. And he says, yeah, like throughout trying to pass the Affordable Care Act, he was like, you know, I'd leave the White House with uh, Sasha and Malia and uh, there'd be guys holding signs outside of the White House with my face made up like the Joker. <laughs> <laughs> but it said nope instead of hope. <laughs> so he actually does give a shout out to that sign in his presidential memoir. <laughs> it made it into the history book. So Talk about being fucking thin skin. This man had the nuclear codes and was like, some yahoos jokerified me <laughs> in front of my daughters. <laughs> so yeah, that's the lib interpretation. The other interpretation is that Obama just at every turn has the worst instincts and this just this horrible pathetic drive towards the center, towards compromise. Basically, I and I think the anecdote about this fucking sign is, is part of it. He has a need mm-hmm. to be liked. He wants to be liked by everybody. So rather than do something that is potentially very unpopular with a small group of people, but which will have dramatic benefits for a large group of people in, in time, he would prefer at every turn to compromise and try to make everybody happy. And one of the things that I was reading about mentions how from the outset, rather than saying we've got our mandate. Look at how much we have in the House and the Senate. We're just going to pass this thing through public option. From the outset, his impulse is let's get the insurance CEOs in the room. Let's get the AMA in the room, the the American Medical Association. What do you think the American (laughs) Medical Association is going to tell you they're (laughs) looking for? Not going to be anything that has the potential to limit what they get to bill for any single thing they do. He just has this horrible impulse to get all the people who are going to try and stop what he's doing in the room with him because he has this inflated sense of I'm going to be able to negotiate and find something that makes everybody happy. And all it does is make sure that every single time something gets passes, it's the weakest, shittiest version mm-hmm. of it that it yep. could possibly be that somehow still benefits <laughs> the insurance companies, somehow still benefits all these people. And at the end of the day, you're fucking refreshing that healthcare <laughs> exchange page, just trying to be like, uh, what tier can I possibly get? My tummy hurts. I really need to see a doctor. Yeah. Yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, we said this on our 2008 episode when we were all together last. The two readings of Obama, which is like the cynical reading. He never wanted to do any of this progressive shit. He just wanted to be popular, like Kyle said. So if you take the cynical view of Obama, then the Tea Party was the greatest thing that ever fucking happened to him. Because his villains were clowns, were buffoons. They dressed up like founding fathers with the fife and drum music. Uh, who's who's the real Joker? Yeah, if you're an Obama worshipping lib, that's what you have to admit at the end of the day. But Obama met his equal adversary in Glenn Beck. This is who foiled Obama, is Glenn Beck, an idiot. The constitutional law professor got dummied by the <laughs> alcoholic Mormon. So how good was he to begin with, if that's who undermined him? And Obama will, would defend himself by pointing out that I had the public option, but I couldn't get enough votes for it. And it's like, well, maybe the president's job is to somehow whip those votes. Do an LBJ, you know, corner these people on the toilet <laughs> and talk about uh, how your dick doesn't have enough room in your pants while you bully them into voting for the public option. <laughs> yeah, man, there was a mania about you. You could have done Obama mania. <laughs> you had all of those people organized. Have those people knock on doors, call their congressmen, whatever. Have them do the thing. But no, I think this probably brings us nicely to the, the next big compromise slash Tea Party get, which is the... the <laughs> oh, yes. Thing. The ding dang debt ceiling. <laughs> Aren't we excited that we get to hear about the debt ceiling three to four times a year now? <laughs> That's something that we got because of the Tea Party. We don't want to go into the fucking weeds of like what money and what debt is in modern monetary policy. But every so often, these people got to threaten to nuke the economy because of the dang deficit. They did. Uh, we had a government shutdown during the Obama years. <laughs> yeah. Do you remember that season of Parks and Rec where they got furloughed? And this is the thing that the Tea Party, <laughs> they got it. They got what they wanted. They pushed yep. it to the brink. And man. Republicans suffered a backlash from it. Because at the end of the day, people want the government to work. Because when you're actually faced with the repercussions of having a non-functioning government, it's one of those things you take for granted, even if you're a right-wing ideologue. You're like, oh shit, I actually need roads to work. I would like to go to a national park, I even would like though to they violate personal liberty. Yeah, even though someone <laughs> could be making more money off of that park than the <laughs> Yosemite he makes. Conservatorship or yeah. whatever. Yeah. It is funny that we have this budget thing that happens every year. Just total dysfunction. Yeah, and one real world effect of the Tea Party, this is something I wasn't aware of at the time, but learned through the Thomas Frank book. A ton of actual grifters who just use this movement as a personal ATM. So there's this weird symbiotic relationship. You have your Cato Institutes and your Heritage Foundations are gassing up this movement of angry people. Then events start cropping up and then products start cropping up. So here's three examples. Sarah Palin, go to talk at a Tea Party event in 2010, $549 tickets. There were also straight up multi-level marketing boys. This dude named Richard Vigory, don't know how to pronounce that, sold the DVD set called Fundraising Secrets for Tea Party Leaders, and the DVD sets cost $297. And he straight up says the quiet part out loud when he writes, not since the late 1970s has there been a more favorable climate for you to launch a conservative organization. The fundraising wins are at your back, and those wins are now blowing at hurricane force. <laughs> it's such an oldie timey con artist approach to it of just being like hey uh, y y trust me you never seen such a big room of uh, schmucks to take advantage of and you know what I have a feeling you're one of the few <laughs> smart ones who can do it yourself you just gotta pay me to tell you how <laughs> Let's we'll start selling a monorail. That sure put Ogdenville on the map. <laughs> yeah, and just all kinds of gear and books got sold. Oh, and the craziest thing that I found from the book in terms of a grift, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, a lobbying group for businessmen and the business psychos. They usually get donations in six-figure increments. Glenn Beck asked his viewers and listeners to <laughs> donate to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce because in his words, quote, they are us. And these donations rolled in and and so many small donations rolled in to the point that the website crashed. They crashed the website giving to businessmen. No, I get a good in service when I give money to a businessman. That's how it works. Yeah, but you're getting freedom in response, Ben. Can you put a price on your freedom? So the primary takeaway for what the Tea Party accomplished is if you believe he wanted to do anything, they neutered Barack Obama. If you cynically believe that he didn't actually want to do any of this stuff, then they were the greatest heel in the fucking world. That 
that's what they accomplished. The banks are bigger than they were before the crash of 2008. To reiterate what we said in our 2008 episode, one thing you can never take away from conservatives is that they have a coherent ideology. They have a framework for how to think about the world and it's monstrous and psychotic and selfish, but they do have beliefs that they are willing to die for. Like after Obama was elected and because of the Tea Party, there were governors that refused hundreds of millions of dollars in federal aid that was supposed to fund Medicare for their citizens. They literally said, we'd rather have thousands of people die than have the government help us. You never get that from leftist politics. You never get politicians who are like willing to die for their beliefs or having a coherent worldview like that. And it's because they never talk about class politics and they never encourage class warfare. And when Glenn Beck says something like what Obama is doing is class warfare, it would be so nice to have a Democratic president who's like, yes, yes, it is actually. <laughs> the, the Chad. Yeah, let's <laughs> yeah. go. The Chad. Yes. Just such a missed opportunity. Like how I started off the show, two paths diverged in 2009. And it was the biggest missed opportunity for progressives, the left, liberals, the Democratic Party, whatever you want to call it. And I'm reminded of the Chapo episode where they review the Pod Johns's book, where they talk about death panels and they talk about birtherism. <laughs> and their only move that they have is you just need to keep talking and keep bringing them the facts. You need to set up a website that has the facts on it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, man. What you need to sell is a fucking vision. Mm -hmm. And the Tea Party, like it or not, sold a vision. A mix of utopianism and apocalypse. And the libs can't sell any message other than America's already great. I've never heard of Obama offering a prescription for increasing wealth inequality. He always talks about how it's an unfortunate byproduct of today's economy. But I've never heard him come out and say, I'm doing this policy because it will fight wealth inequality. It's like now when he fucking pops up out of the woodwork every couple of months to just comment on one of the current realities of the world. Or to sink Bernie Sanders' campaign. <laughs> And, you know, yeah. and the easy response is always, you were in charge for eight years. You had eight years to change literally anything yeah. about what got us here. And you didn't, bro. You yeah. just it's like, didn't. it's like Trump saying, we need to look into the Clintons or like lock her up. But it's like, dude, you were president. Fucking go, go after her. Put all the resources of the state into looking at Hillary Clinton if that's what you wanted. But don't bitch about it after you leave. Same thing goes for Obama. Don't bitch about these things. You were president for eight years. That's the Tea Party biggest accomplishments, their list of dubs. Let's talk echoes in the culture. And here's the Ben take. This is not in Thomas Frank's book because it came out in 2011. I think the Tea Party was largely a product of not talking about class and material conditions. So as people witness their lives slowly get worse, like I said at the top of the show, the Bush years were bad years for anyone who got paid by the hour. People see their lives get worse. Housing becomes less affordable. Their wages are stagnant. The cost of living goes up. Sure, they have two-day delivery on Amazon. Sure, they have have larger, thinner TVs than they used to have. The treats help. The treats are a salve. But on the whole, people aren't stupid and they see their lives get worse in material ways. But because there's no space to talk about that at all, we need to come up with non-class and material reasons for deteriorating conditions. The first round is the Tea Party. The reason is actually every politician ever for the last 100 years was a secret socialist <laughs> who distorted the market. And the answer to all your problems is the free market utopianism movement. Okay, huge Republican victories. They do that for the most part. Barack Obama goes cutting taxes and shit. People's lives continue to get worse. The 2010s, we get the fucking gig economy explode. The next round, the reskinned Tea Party is the MAGA movement. And this one's a lot more traditional. Why is my life getting worse? Well, it's those dang immigrants and Muslims, don't you know? Build the wall Muslim ban. And Trump wins off of the scapegoating. Material conditions continue to deteriorate. <laughs> How could our boy Trump have fucked up? Well, of course it's QAnon. Well, of course it's the black hat pedophiles, it's the fucking Hollywood clones, whatever. When you leave a gap for why is my life getting worse and don't say capitalism... <laughs> This is what comes in. This is what fills that crack. This is what fills the gap. And I, for one, am very excited to see what QAnon morphs into. <laughs> I'm really excited for the fourth skin in this franchise of how in the world do we redirect the legitimate populist anger into literally anywhere else. So we have talked a little bit about the ideology of the Tea Party. We've talked a little bit about the articles, the, the Glenn Beck intellectual heft behind the movement. But what did this movement actually do? 
do. A movement isn't just articles. A movement is people going to rallies, people going to town halls, people hosting events. And I have a few examples that show the absurdity of this movement, but also what they managed to accomplish in 2009 and 2010. So Labor Day 2009 in West Virginia, there was a rally with the express purpose of announcing solidarity between coal miners and the coal mine operators who employ them. We had Sean Hannity show up. We had Ted Nugent, the Nuge, show up. And also the CEO of Massey Energy, Don Blakenship. They dressed in their American flag clothing. This radical event protesting mine regulations was bankrolled by the mine employer. The CEO Blankenship said that he was there to, quote, defend American labor because no one else will. The CEO is defending labor. He said that specifically, and I'm quoting from uh, Thomas Frank here, the CEO was standing tall against, quote, our government leaders who are, with their safety and environmental meddling, American workers' worst nightmare. So this is how you do the old switcheroo and have a working class movement for business. This insane muddling. We can have a good laugh, but here's where it gets a little bit macabre. Eight months after that rally, quoting Frank again, 29 workers in Massey's upper big branch mine were dead from a huge underground explosion that almost certainly would have been minimized if Massey had followed standard safety and ventilation practices or if U.S. mine inspectors had backed up their many citations of the operation with proper enforcement. Just to clarify, yeah, the miners and the mine operators were standing in solidarity together against government regulations like uh, safety precautions. Do I have that right? Yeah, they were trying to get the other kind of miners to also be allowed to do uh, to work. <laughs> I love that old West Virginia protest song from the Mother Jones era where she's singing about how the damn government needs to get rid of its safety regulations. <laughs> yeah, how the mighty have fallen. The West Virginia mine wars were the largest insurrection against the federal government since the Civil War, where these miners were shooting at private investigators and the fucking army who brought biplanes in to bomb the striking miners. And now they're at a fucking Ted Nugent concert being like, yay! <laughs> I'm of the famous protest song hey be nicer to my boss <laughs> he's having a hard day it's actually shocking to the system to metabolize that the horrible wry irony of those things being eight months apart if you just shared that anecdote with like marks via time machine he would just have a stroke <laughs> like that <laughs> Another example that I got of some of the real world effects is, of course, the town hall. They loved the town hall. And we had some viral moments. The Tea Party movement existed in the articles and the op-eds, and it existed on YouTube also. So in a town hall, you got your Q&A. And there was one famous one that went low-key viral where we had a guy named David W. Hendrick, a management consultant and former Marine. So David H. Hendrick gets the mic at one of these town halls. And he's talking about education. He says, quote, I heard you say tonight about educating our children, indoctrinating our children, whatever you want to call it. Hendrick began, I'm quoting Frank again, on the soon to be famous videotape, the congressman can be heard mumbling a reply, but before he finishes, Hendrick erupts, stay away from my kids. We got the proto Moms for Liberty movement. And the audience explodes with approval, but this is just the beginning. We get a little history lesson to this democratic politician. Quote, the Nazis were the National Socialist Party. They were leftist. Mm. And the general thrust of his argument is that the Democrats were, in their mind, were taking over banks with the bailouts, taking over automakers with the bailouts, and taking over health care with Obamacare. And to this amateur historian, he said that if Nancy Pelosi wanted to search the country for Nazis, quote, maybe the first place she should look is the sleeve of her own arm. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, so they're going to these town halls and they're yelling at any politician, I guess, and just calling them Nazis because Nazis, you know, I guess they did have some level of government control of the system. Yeah, they also banned trade unions as one of the first things they did. <laughs> like in that Holocaust poem, first they came to the for the trade unionists, very first. Right. It's hard to remember that there was a time only like 15 years ago when the right wing was against Nazis. 
We are now solidly in the era where actually even the Canadian government is like, well, they're not so bad. They're so, so they're old now. They're old and cute. It doesn't count if they were Ukrainian Nazis. And yeah, this goes viral on YouTube. They play it over and over again on Fox News. And this Hendrick guy becomes like a low-key grifter. He makes a tea party book for kids called The Liberal Clause about, I believe it's stealing the Christmas tuition. I believe it's the wordplay that it works on. <laughs> I personally believe the Christmas Constitution is infallible. <laughs> yeah. Just going to quote Frank. The book was, of course, a Christmas story, which is to say a contribution to the vast literature of complaint about how Christmas has been debased and uprooted from its rightful origins. The liberal clause, Hendrick called it, and it was a simple fable for the Tea Party era. It seems that evil liberal elves had stolen an election and installed the usurper on Santa's throne. The liberal clause, aka Barack Obama. This imposter clause, quote, are you even from the North Pole? An elf questioned. Ooh, a little birtherism in there. <laughs> buys off the children with free candy. He flouts the Christmas tuition, claiming that, quote, very smart people can find authorization for his misdeeds in that document, even though ordinary people can't. He even requires Santa's elves to join unions, using as his enforcer an elf who uses German words and wears jackboots, a clever nod, apparently, to Hitler's alliance with organized labor, something I have never heard of before, but which I guess history-minded tea partiers know all about. But in his imagining, it's bad that Santa is giving away free things, which is, again, the whole, the how Christmas works. So in his mind, should Santa be capitalist? Should we be making deals with Santa? Like, it should be, like, sitting on his lap and being like, ah, oh, negotiating uh, the contract, which will delineate exactly how uh, and which Christmas gifts they'll get. Apparently. Can you imagine telling your child goodnight after reading them this story? <laughs> yeah. What do you do when, after you kiss and tuck in your kid and walk into the bathroom to brush your teeth, you look at yourself in the mirror having read the liberal clause at your children uh, yeah because what exactly is their ideology on how the north pole should work as an economy because okay, so i guess he's anti-elf union well, he's, mm -hmm. he's an originalist when it comes to the christmatution so <laughs> it's it's how the founding father christmas is originally intended it <laughs> <laughs> in the book, there are illustrations of a Stalin elf, a Castro elf, and a Hugo Chavez elf, all of them lending a hand to their liberal North Pole pals. I got one more example of some real world. One thing that is worth emphasizing, this was the small business reaction. And what's fascinating is that the myth of small business employment has been thoroughly debunked by economists, but is just held as truth. The right wingers say that 90% of all employment is driven by small business, but this was a a small business driven movement because deregulate for Walmart doesn't have as much appeal as deregulate for me, a small businessman in my community, right? And there's this resentment where the small business does not have pride of place anymore in the American economy because we have all these fucking monopolies and oligopolies. So this is kind of a resentful reaction to their place not being there. Yeah, well, they were pissed about the employer mandate mm -hmm. that employers had to provide health insurance for their employees. But I, I believe only if they had over 50 employees yeah. yeah which is a vanishingly small number of small businesses the people who are filling these town halls are the people who yeah run like a car wash that employs three 16 year olds that they pay seven dollars <laughs> to it's kind of wild mm -hmm. but this is one of the things that's so interesting is when you actually look at demographically the bulk of vocal tea party years and the people at these rallies yeah they're they're like the small business tyrant class and part of that switcheroo is them misidentifying with big business and like, imagining themselves as being in the same league mm. and this idea that oh it's good if major banks and if yeah the CEO of Walmart and a mining a mining CEO has less regulation and succeeds because I will too and it's like your car wash is not going to do any better if Amazon is allowed to prevent people from urinating yeah the hot tub chemicals that you <laughs> sell out of your garage <laughs> they treat it with the same level of business intensity as as like standard oil or something <laughs> yeah and the real world knock on effects of this movement is that 40% of the Republicans who swept into the House of Representatives in 2010 in that election that Barack Obama called a shellacking, 40% of them were small business owners, right? And this is long before um, Lauren Boebert with her dope ass <laughs> food poisoning grill that she ran, you know, shooters. These yahoos who 
held the entire economy hostage. They did it because they were small business leaders. And one of the things that Frank points out is that these small businesses, even if, like Giordano said jokingly, like selling chemicals out of your garage, they still have 100-page tax returns because they actually are kind of regulated in a way that giant businesses aren't. And like giant businesses have entire divisions to deal with and dodge regulations. So I don't want to feel sympathy for these people because I do think that they're deeply misguided about regulations because their, to use the Twitter word, lived experience of regulation is not what happens for giant mining conglomerates. I love the idea of the pool chemical guy being like getting his three teenage employees together and just being like, all right, we're going to go over the new plan for the business, which is we're going to move our headquarters to Delaware. We're also going to open uh, an offshore sector in the Cayman <laughs> Islands and then one more in Ireland because the tax breaks are very favorable there. However, we will continue to sell them uh, entirely out of my garage. One last one, and then we'll close up our examples. In 2010, there was a Tea Party proposal for a national day of strike. These people, they use the words of the left, and they almost seem to use the message of the left, because it turns out left-wing messaging is very popular, especially in hard times. But this national day of strike was meant to confront big business. Here's how the logic goes. Congress is controlled by a powerful business interest. One gung-ho strike supporter wrote, quoting Frank again, Congress won't listen to us, so it's time to bypass them and go above their heads on the totem pole of power. A strike, the theory went, would force big business to restrain its lobbyists and to stop the flow of bribe money to Washington. Only then would liberalism finally cease. The plan, in other words, was to stage the biggest industrial showdown of all time on the basis of a colossal mix-up. The idea that big business was bankrolling liberalism, that liberalism existed because of corporate bribe, and that only through a general strike against corporate America could capitalism be saved. Yeah, this didn't happen. There was no massive proletarian walk-off against big business in 2010, but this is what the folks were posting about. So in our closing thoughts, I think Thomas Frank really hits the nail on the head where he concludes his entire book by saying, you know, we've had a lot of fun laughing at the contradictions and the rhetorical whipsy flipsies and, and doing a fact check on the Tea Party. But at the end of the day, you know what all of this nonsense is better than? Better than nothing, which is what the the alternative was, which is what the Democrats offered. There was no left-wing populism to be offered as a counter to this totally politically and intellectually incoherent right-wing populism. And he cites a really interesting passage from Barack Obama's 2006 book. And I think it kind of shows the Obama and early 2010s damn ideology. Obama wrote, increasingly, I'm not going to do the voice, <laughs> I found myself <laughs> spending time with people of means, law firm partners and investment bankers, hedge fund managers and venture capital capitalists. This is from The Audacity of Hope, 2006, before he's elected. As a rule, they were smart, interesting people, knowledgeable about public policy, liberal in their politics, expecting nothing more than a hearing of their opinions in exchange for their checks. But they reflected, almost uniformly, the perspectives of their class, the top 1% or so of the income scale that can afford to write a $2,000 check to a political candidate. They believed in the free market and an educational meritocracy. They found it hard to imagine that there might be any social ill that could not be cured by a high SAT score. They had no patience with protectionism, found unions troublesome, and were not particularly sympathetic to those whose lives were upended by the movements of global capital. I know that as a consequence of my fundraising, I became more like the wealthy donors I met, Obama confesses a few paragraphs later. Oh my God, he admitted it! And that's exactly who he is and who he was as president. Of course he was never going to offer an alternative to the Tea Party. He needs to represent the donors of his class that he just described. He really, he did cards on the table for us in 2006. He told us exactly <laughs> who he was. <laughs> I mean, what's remarkable and sad is how nothing about that has changed. The exact same thing that got the Tea Party to have their surge just happened again in 2016. And of course, now, unless something drastically changes, all indications are that literally the exact same thing is going to happen again in 2024. We're just barreling towards the exact same outcome because the Democratic Party is just fundamentally mentally incapable at this point of responding to any type of populist or working class interest whatsoever. And the last thing I'll say for the ongoing Nachleben, as the Germans say, the afterlife of an idea of hmm. free market utopianism, we just had an election in Argentina and we, they elected a guy who's going to just, I don't know, we saw a video of him just ripping off labels from a wall of every single department that he's going to destroy of the Argentinian state. Everything from, you know, the classic bugbear of the right wing, like the Department of Women's Education
station or whatever, but also just like public works entirely is going to go. <laughs> and you may scoff, think we're being alarmist or histrionic. Let the anarcho capitalists run Argentina. He wants to legalize the sale of human organs in the interest of free market ideology. So it is still with us. It, uh, we, we thought it was just too perfect that right as we recorded this episode, this horrendous election in Argentina happened. This uh, Javier Millet. Th- yeah, the remarkable thing about him is that the dude is operating at 11 out of 10 at all times. <laughs> and his, <laughs> his fans just call him the madman. <laughs> <El loco. laughs> <laughs> it is the most jokerified election of our times. It's just literally people being like, oh, the guys who who's unhinged and whose entire promise is to burn everything to the ground. Perfect. Sounds about right. Yeah, they're having their own economic crisis. And it's weird that I guess they can't have some guy who's crazy to fund the public works department. <laughs> Funded. Funded. <laughs> Funded. Just slapping the magnets right back on the board. Bam. 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 I was like, listen, I'm going to go in with an open mind, good faith reading of his policies. He says they need to cut everything because inflation's at like 140%. What is organ sale other than just a cash infusion into the society? <laughs> He's putting more money out there. He's going to raise inflation with all of this organ money sloshing around the economy. Sloshing around in the empty cavity where someone's kidney used to be (laughs) everything i read about it puts it like solidly in the category of if you don't make a joke the only alternative is to lie down on the floor and cry because i am genuinely frightened for the argentinian people and and what is coming for them yeah wasn't it one of his other plans also to retake the falkland islands sure oh let's go (laughs) no i yeah i think i saw that which is hilarious because that seems like it would involve some kind of public spending (laughs) Oh, I did want to give a shout out, by the way, I guess if we're still talking about like the impact of the Tea Party, Mitt Romney was a classic Tea Party candidate in certain ways and that he was a billionaire. <laughs> <laughs> and he was sort of undone because he made comments about government's involvement in people's lives. Shout out to the busboy who risked his job to do real world praxis by filming one of Mitt Romney's millionaire dinners, uh, the campaign fundraiser, and recorded him saying that basically 47% of Americans will never vote for him because they're leeches. they receive some kind of government assistance. We should just write these people off as leeches and as people who take from the system. And it's like this is half the country and it includes anyone over the age of 65, <laughs> anyone on Medicare. So that that was a situation where like the ideology of the Tea Party found itself into deciding an election, although it was against the Tea Party because people were like, oh, wait, this is a little morbid the way that you see wait, the world. I, yeah. I want to be calling other people leeches i i didn't sign up to be called the leech myself that's not what this is about (laughs) that bus boy was related to jimmy carter so that was carter's revenge from beyond the grave it was published in uh, mother jones which is a pretty appropriate name for something like that My closing thoughts are there was uh, an economic development throughout the 1940s called the Great Compression, and it actually referred to a time when wealth inequality was reduced. People's incomes actually got closer together throughout the 40s and 50s. And this was a result of this progressive movement by FDR to do income redistribution, the the new deal with government. The deal is you get government help in exchange for living in a society, right? (laughs) And what these Tea Party people want is to go back to the guild age of government regulations. And I just think it's very interesting that all of these people like Glenn Beck, like fucking Bill O'Reilly, like Rush Limbaugh, they want to restore honor, right? I think that was Glenn Beck's rally name, the rally to restore honor. (laughs) And they always call back to like the 1950s, this time of compressed incomes. And they talk about how we need to go back to that. They all benefited from a society that was more equal. But now that their adults want to go back to the Gilded Age or a time when they can benefit personally from having more money at the expense of everybody else. Oh, yeah. Putting the 50s up on the pedestal for the right is so fucking funny because, yeah, the marginal tax rate was like 90% <laughs> or whatever, right? Yeah, it should have been a period of leftist ascendancy. Some people view political economy in terms of 40-year cycles. 1900 to 1940, you know, your, your triangle shirtwaist <laughs> years, that's like some pure free market Gilded Age economy there. And then you get a reaction, the pendulum swings. And from the 40s, 50s, 60s, 
and towards the end of the 70s, that's the period of the liberal ascendancy. We get the New Deal. We get the Great Society. We get like some social programs. And then the pendulum swings back in this Reaganomics and neoliberalism from the late 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s. We were due, man. <laughs> we were due for our turn at bat for the liberal policy. And the Tea Party fucking stole it from mm-hmm. us. <laughs> and the Democratic Party. <laughs> yes. Well, that, that's what's so remarkable is that we had the ostensibly leftist party in power and yet arguably rightist neoliberal stuff is what actually prevailed. Yeah, I, so I was I was like trying to sit back and like conceptualize the shift going from the Tea Party, going to MAGA, going to QAnon and sort of chart out and kind of understand the change there. And I think one of the ways I think about it is almost like, you know, you have this initial astroturf movement that's, you don't have to be a genius to be like, ah, billionaires benefit from this. The things that they are saying are really directly related to what is going to benefit the people who are already making tremendous amounts of money. And something interesting happens along the way where it's almost like a Frankenstein's monster metastasis type of thing where as the movement shifts, and as you were saying, Ben, as the people in it are increasingly subjected to in-your-face examples of like, the government will not do anything to help you. And not only that, but you are going to be continuously lied to about the objective reality that you're in. Like you were saying in the John Stewart episode, the gaslighting that people are now exposed to. There's only so many mental psychic injuries that people can take and still maintain any type of order or maintain a coherent response to it. As you shift from Maggot into QAnon, you're basically seeing people driven insane <laughs> by the governments and the society that they're a part of because you just keep being told actually everything is fine. The economy is actually good. The economy mm-hmm. is good. I know that you have no reason to believe that and that everything about your material conditions would argue otherwise, but mm, Dow Jones is up. So you got to stop your complaining <laughs> and no, you can't afford where you're living and no, you can't afford food, but things are fine and you're fine. And there's only so much people can handle that before they to get psychoanalytic you know, the more mature, immature defenses of your projections, your passive aggression, you know, things like that into the full blown delusion and like just becoming, frankly, psychotic <laughs> on, at a mass level, which is basically what the QAnon movement is. It's funny to think the Tea Party movement gets a couple people elected to Congress and they get a couple people elected. They get a couple legislative wins, mostly to shut down things like that. And then you trace forward and it's like, who is getting in now? It's fucking Marjorie Taylor mm-hmm. Green. You could could argue that those people before were were useful idiots. And it's like, we are now in the stage where I think she's just an <laughs> idiot. Like I'm not, I don't know what having her, I, I don't know who's benefiting from her now being in government <laughs> and, and the people like her. And that's where it's this funny thing where this movement, yeah, that was mostly petty pirates of uh, small business were like swept up in it. And then as it's crept and as everybody's material reality has gotten worse and like more and more people, you could argue that each movement has actually been successively bigger than the last. Now you've got yoga moms. Now you've got people from really all swaths of life are being pulled into this stuff and QAnon. And it's just like, yeah, because collectively everyone has been driven insane. And that's where like, I don't know what happens next, but is anyone still harnessing this in an effective way? Yeah. Are the Koch brothers just so stoked that Marjorie Taylor Greene is calling people (laughs) pedophiles in her tweets? Like, ah, yes, it's all going according to plan. You know, it's hard to imagine. Yeah. I don't know what what happens next because if things just keep getting worse, things are going to be become increasingly unhinged. And I do think it is interesting now, this impulse that you see, this very destructive death drive, outwardly aimed death drive impulse to like destroy things that you could argue was a little bit there in the early days of the Tea Party. We've got to destroy government, but no one really wanted to really take things down. I don't know. Is that the next step? Is you're actually going to have people who are like, you know what? Fuck it. This isn't working. Let's actually burn it to the ground and see what happens. And I don't know how we, we avert that march towards the societal death drive without, yeah, a leftist response. Some type of collective response has to rise up to give someone an alternative. Otherwise, people are getting desperate and it's just going to get worse. And if no one else is saying anything, and at some point someone's going to look at uh, their name, like Romana Digilu or whatever the fucking QAnon <laughs> queen and just be like, well, you know what? Fuck it. I guess. Uh, I, yeah. Why not? She'll, she's telling me she's going to get rid of my uh, utility bills. So fuck <laughs> it. I'll hop on the bus. Yeah, I mean, I think I think you're starting to see it. I think the current thing that the right is trying to break down is obviously schools. They use the COVID shutdowns and they use drag queen story hour and they use 
CRT, anything they can do to change this economic issue of we don't want to fund public education into a culture issue around race and gender and sexual orientation. That's the Trojan horse that they're using. They want everything to be independent, like an independent private charter or homeschool. That is the goal. That's the next domino to fall in their crusade against social services in the state. Oh, Mm -hmm. yeah. On our last episode, we ended with a pie on to the library. (laughs) This week, it's schools. They're actually good. Public education. (laughs) Big fan. Reading. Arithmetic. The other subjects. All right, that's been the show. Remember Shuffle on the Tea Party. If you joined us, as always, thank you so much for listening. Please like and subscribe. We respond to every comment, every message on Instagram. Makes our day. We did, yeah. I'll actually give a shout out to a commenter who insisted in a comment recently, and I think they even emailed us. They said, I really want to hear the rest of Kyle's explanation of the Dan Brown books, and so please put that up. <laughs> <laughs> the truth will not be kept from them. We, we goofed on Kyle for going on a like a 30-minute explanation of the Dan Brown plots, but the people, they've been clamoring to hear that whole explanation. So I'll put that this up an, shortly. This is an AstroTurf movement. Kyle paid that guy <laughs> to say that thing. <laughs> uh, that's so fucking funny. Huge thanks to our guest Kyle for coming on. Thanks, bud. Always fun to have you on the I just One of the comments that made me laugh was the one of someone complaining about us all having the same voice. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, which is like, well, you know, what are we going to do about that? <laughs> it's, just, <laughs> it's just the way we talk. And, you know, we can't help but that we grew up within a few kilometers of one another and <laughs> therefore have the exact same speech pattern but maybe (laughs) next time maybe next time we all do accents oi brav (laughs) and shout out to isaac who was on our last episode who gave us the idea for this episode all right yes thank you so much to kyle our guests for coming on ciao ciao have a good one peace